Okay, behavior, remember there's the little circles. There's cognition, behavior, you know, coping and emotion skills deficits. There's research that shows that from um, kids who have a depressed parent, from birth forward, actually um, develop as a result of the interactions with the depressed parent, a lack of coping skills and emotion regulation skills. So that deficit is evident from very early in life and continues on. I don't think that one, this slides in your handouts. So um, when we're working with depressed kids, we're going to assume that they have a coping and emotion um, skills deficit they typically have a problem-solving skills deficit. Okay, so what's the difference between a skills deficit and a performance deficit? So, Tuma? The skills deficit is you know, they actually don't know how to do it, whereas a performance deficit, they have the skills, but maybe have trouble actually enacting the skills. Yep. So, what would cause them to not be able to enact the skill if they have it. So like if I know how to solve problems, but I'm not doing it, what's getting in the way? Right, negative thinking. If, you're help, if you have a core belief of I'm helpless, you're not going to use problem solving. And the same with those of you who, again, are working with anxious kids. What happens, what can get in the way of their problem solving? Avoidance. Okay, avoidance, and what else? Fear, the extreme anxiety. They're so overstimulated with the anxiety, they can't do the problem solving. So what's the parallel in depression? Helplessness. Yeah, they're helpless and they're so overwhelmed by their sadness, why bother? I'm not going to do it. Okay? So affect can be so powerful that it helps to create the performance deficit, as does their negative thinking. And the same with interpersonal skills. We actually did a study where um, the small scale, it had, no, it's never published because it's too small, but um, we ended up finding that the kids had a, um, pretty good interpersonal skills, the depressed kids, but they didn't enact those skills because of the negative thinking. Um, they might have academic skills deficits. Here's the one that I've been kind of shocked at, and it's a lack of recreation skills. Kids don't know how to have fun. And it's really a, um, uh, it's a generational thing. So today, the younger kids, how do they, what are they um, taught in terms of what do they have access to for having fun? The computer and games, games video game system. It's solitary. It's solitary. That's it. It's solitary, it's disconnected, and it's a screen. And um, so I had this one kid I was working with who came from a um, real wealthy background, and he could have done anything that he wanted to do. His parents would have supported it. So I'm in, we're in Austin, I'm thinking Five Lakes, kids, um, you know, 15 years old. What could he do? He could go jet skiing. He could take um, sailboat lessons. He could learn how to scuba dive. He could go um, parachute jumping. He could go, um, what's the new fad is um, where you're on the surfboard and you have, yeah, there you go, wakeboarding, water skiing. Um, he could go s use that sail on the, um, on, yeah, on the boards, tons of things. He could go mountain biking. Austin's a phenomenal mountain biking community. He could go fishing, he could go hunting, he could um, go to the museums, he could um, participate in sports, he could participate in music. Austin's live music capital of the world. There's all these great schools for learning how to be a rock and roll star if you're a kid. And he knew nothing of that. All he knew 
was what to do with the screens. He couldn't even think of it. I'm getting all excited. I'm going, wow, you could go and, you know, you could rent a, you could get sailboat lessons. You could learn how to, you know, um, sail. Wouldn't that be fun? Eh. He'd never done it. Had no experience with any of those things. I took him bowling. One session, I convinced him we could go bowling. Never done it before. He had a blast. We had cheeseburgers at the number one hamburger place in town, followed by bowling. He hadn't done that kind of thing ever before. He had fun. So we, kids have to learn how to have fun. And today, they're learning screens. And um, that leads to depression. If you um, don't learn to, how to have fun and you don't bring joy into your life, it, re it brings your mood down. So for the kids that you're working with, they often have real restrictions in what they can do. Most of them come in, their number one thing that they love to do are computers and the video games. And they're geniuses at that. So we do have the computers that never used it once because it's like, talk to me, look at me, uh -huh. interact. Yeah. So I think what, when I, if I had kids that I'm, when I have kids that I'm working with that are on the spectrum, the autism spectrum, um, I want to teach them how to have fun and do things that um, are going to raise their mood. Because if I can get them out active and having fun, that's going to help lift the depression. And so when kids are on the spectrum, what's the other difficulty that we face? Social. Exactly. They don't have the social skills, nor the desire often to interact with others. So getting them out and with other people is really important. But helping them to value that is another um, you know, real difficult thing to do. Um, the learning history may be loss, trauma, um, things that lead to I'm unlovable, helpless, maladaptive beliefs, skills deficits. Primary environments, we know for depressed kids, they tend to be, um, include more stress. Um, there could be depression or anxiety in a parent. Um, conflict, negative affective tone, maybe marital conflict. That's one thing that's been rarely discussed in the literature is uh, marital conflict and the impact that has on the kids. Matter of fact, I don't think there is a study yet that specifically looked at depression and uh, marital conflict. It's talked about, but it hasn't been specifically investigated as far as I know. Um, coercive parenting strategies, neglect and abuse. Uh, the younger the kids, the more likely that there's neglect or abuse. So when the, the little bit of research on um, preschoolers that are depressed, um, showed a very strong link to neglect and abuse. Uh, lack of parental availability, that's you know becoming more common as the economy demands parents' time. They don't have the time to be with their kids. Uh, less cohesion, communication, social activities, and recreational activities in the family. And we know that stress um, due to the biological oops, impact actually does um, affect um, you know, the stress affects what's going on biologically. It impacts the brain. So um, stress can lead to the development of the, a cognitive diathesis. Likewise, it can lead to the development of a biologically based um, diathesis. There's some um, Research that's shown that um, depressed adults, there's a smaller kind of hippocampus. And um, the longer the duration of the depressive episode, the more shrinking of the hippocampus. And um, we know the hippocampus is involved in forming new memories as well as um, concentration. So if you think about it, the depressed individuals recall negative events more. Um, you know, we've seen that there's some genetic basis, obviously, to depression. 
And now we'll go into a case. OK, so how would you um, conceptualize this case? So it's a boy, Mike. Mike's the number one name, most common name among boys. Um, 12 years old, Child Protective Services is involved because um, his maternal caregiver has a history of substance dependence. Father's in prison for drug dealing. Presents as irritable, sad, cries frequently, and doesn't know why. His best friend, who was a neighbor, has moved out of um, town, so he doesn't have access to that friend anymore. Currently doesn't have any other friends, and he thinks that his classmates are um, making fun of him when they really aren't. So he believes they're making fun of him, but they're really not. Um, he's not socially engaged, and um, he's pretty irritable. So that irritability pushes ki other kids away and keeps them at distance. So um, if you're irritable and you push other people away, what belief is that going to support? I'm unlovable. There it is. Um, he doesn't have other recreational activities, verbalizes a lot of negative thoughts about himself, gives up easily and won't start um, demanding tasks. His mom won't let him out of the house in the evenings after he gets home from school because she thinks the neighborhood's unsafe. And um, he stays up really late into the night um, playing video games, doesn't go to bed, so he never gets enough sleep. Okay, what other questions do you have about Mike or thoughts? Does he have any siblings? He doesn't have any siblings. What else? Anything else you'd want to know? Um, let's see. She didn't initially. We did end up hooking her in with some, oh, you mean social support, like a social network? Yeah, like okay, I was thinking like, uh-huh. Um, she does have some family, but she's pretty distant because of her um, substance abuse. And her um, social network is other substance abusers. So she's really locked into that um, whole community of um, abusers. Their idea of fun is getting high. Yeah? Pardon me? Um, let's see. Well, he's inconsistently, he doesn't go to school consistently. So it's kind of a mixed bag. And um, his social network at school is the other kids that do drugs. Um, he smokes um, pot and um, goes to all the websites that, um, it, that provide evidence that um, weed's a good thing for him. And um, any discussions or any data that suggests that it's not is part of a government conspiracy. So um, he's pretty, pretty locked into it, but um, he's not smoking daily. Um, and smokes more kind of socially, but is difficult because he's definitely into that scene, and my guess is that will be a problem for him later in life. When he's not in school, what is he doing? Playing video games around the house. That's about it. Fortunately, he hasn't turned to um, he has a lot of unstructured time where he's home alone. Fortunately, he hasn't turned to getting high while he's at home alone yet. How long has he been experiencing these issues? Um, let's see. The depression's really been there more over about the last um, about year. Okay, so 
Um, what's going on here in terms of his learning environment? Yeah. Right? So we're thinking of each of those kind of circles in that um, conceptualization diagram. All right, so he's um, experienced the loss of parents due to substance abuse, depression, dependence, and incarceration. All right, so um, one of the um, risk factors for developing depression is loss of a parent. All right, so that's happened. He lost his um, dad to going to prison, and he's essentially lost his mom to the drug dependence. All right, so remember the concept of kids try to make meaning out of um, their daily things that are happening on a daily basis. If your parent is caught up in um, using substances instead of interacting with you, I'm there we go. What else? I'm unlovable. I'm unlovable. If my parent really loved me, she'd stop getting high and she'd spend time with me. All right? I try to get my mom to spend time with me. I try to get her to do other things than get high, but she won't. I, I can't stop her. That leads to I'm helpless. Okay? So you've got an environment that is already establishing the three core beliefs in depression. I'm worthless, unlovable, and helpless. Remember, even just one of those can um, be the diathesis. All right, you've got a parent who um, abuses substances. All right, so um, mom comes home, she's stressed, what does she do? Gets high. All right, mom's had a rough kind of week, she wants to celebrate, what does she do? Mom has an argument with. Um, an in-law, a parent, or a friend, what does she do? <laughs> she gets high, all right? Um, mom's anxious because her bills aren't getting paid. She gets high, all right? So um, what's mom modeling in terms of coping skills? Yeah, that's it. She's not, she's not showing um, tolerance for negative affect, and she's not demonstrating or modeling how to manage emotions at all, or stress. What about problem solving? How's the problem solving? Sure. Yeah, right. So there's no modeling at problem solving. And then we've got um, chaos, neglect, which once again um, leads to the development of the negative core beliefs. The affective tone of the house, it's going to be you know, all over the place. So um, it's real inconsistent, unpredictable, which leads to that sense of helplessness. Helplessness from not being able to get the parents to stop abusing. Um, their inconsistent behavior management, which is really emotion-based. So when mom is in a bad mood, she yeah, gets upset, she punishes. Same behavior when mom's in a good mood, no consequence. Okay, so there's a real kind of um, inconsistency and there's a real affective charge to when she does punish, which then sticks and leads to, wow, I must really be bad. Okay? Um, Mike never learned to accept limits. He doesn't have them, they're inconsistent. So what does he do? stays up late and plays video games, and can act out, can um, get involved in the drug scene at school. So parents' interpersonal skills, what do you think they're going to be? They center around getting high. It's not about intimacy. It's not about really healthy relationships. It's about getting high, laughing, and enjoying drugs together. So not a good model for um, interpersonal skills. <coughs> Recreation, obviously, centers around being high and drinking. So he's not learning how to have fun either in a healthy way. All right, so you can, um, so all those conclusions that we just talked about, 
what concept are they based on? Deductive reasoning that comes from that idea of um, the kids to actively seek out the meaning of the things that are happening around them. So um, we just looked at all the things that are happening around them and then thought about what kind of cognitive conclusion would might come to from all of those things. And so that shows you how Mike could have developed that um, I'm unlovable, helpless, and worthless belief. And so that's what we got. The world's unpredictable, and future's unpredictable as well. Other beliefs he had, people use others to get what they need. Um, it's horrible, unbearable to feel bad. That's a pretty dangerous belief, isn't it? But it's a core belief that, or in this case, just an intermediate belief, that leads to the development of substance abuse. Because it's horrible to be, feel bad. You're not supposed to feel bad. It's intolerable. So you smoke weed instead. You do other drugs instead. So that's a really dangerous um, belief for him to hold on to. And that's something that's going to make him at risk for um, continued substance abuse if we don't change that. And he had the belief getting high fixes everything. And um, people aren't there for you when you need them. There are no consequences for my behavior. Emotions in general are bad. Don't get close to people, they leave. Coping skills, he's got a deficit. Can't handle stress. Um, doesn't really know how to manage his mood. Same with the problem solving. Interpersonal skills, he lacks intimacy, um, keeps distance from others because they're just going to leave and hurt you anyway, or they use you. Um, doesn't seek out intimacy. Friendships are real superficial. They center around just getting high. Um, Associates with other kids from the drug culture. Doesn't trust others, manipulates others for personal gain, and um, has a lack of a social network. All right, so when you're conceptualizing a case, you create a problem list, okay? And then you look at what could be the cognitive variable that underlies each of those problems. So in this case, um, our problem list starts with a coping skills deficit. Right? So what underlies that? I'm helpless and getting high solves everything. Problem solving de deficit, I'm helpless again, getting high is the solution. Lack of intimacy, I'm unlovable, you can't trust anyone. Um, keeps people at a distance, you can't trust anyone. Superficial friends don't get close, they leave. Doesn't seek friendships, I'm unlovable. Associates with other um, druggies, getting high is the solution. Doesn't trust others, you can't trust anyone. Manipulates others, you manipulate people to get what you want, what you need. And lack of social network, I'm unlovable, can't trust others, etc. Okay? So, when you're conceptualizing a case, you come up with your problem list, and then you ask yourself, what are the thoughts that underlie each of those problems? Okay. All right. Um, so he lacks recreational skills, not behaviorally active, inappropriate behavior, um, followed by anger. So at school, he gets in trouble and he gets ticked because um, those consequences are unfair. Poor sleep hygiene, um, he creates chaos wherever he is. And emotionally, his moods are all over the place. Um, he's kind of embedded in a tone of chaos, deficit in knowledge of how to manage them, doesn't seek, see a link to his own behavior and thoughts. So his emotions just come up from anywhere. Okay, so there's our problem list again. 
And so what underlies it? I'm helpless, um, underlies the re lack of recreational skills, and getting high solves everything. It's not behaviorally active because he's helpless. Inappropriate behavior followed by anger. He thinks there are no consequences to my behavior. There shouldn't be any. Um, creates chaos. The world's unpredictable. Sleep hygiene because there's no consequences. Um, dysphoria from I'm unlovable, I'm helpless, I'm worthless. Irritability from I'm, unhelp I'm helpless and it's unbearable to feel bad. Deficit in emotion regulation skills from I'm helpless. Doesn't see a link between behavior, emotions, and cognition. It stems from that belief. There are no consequences for my behavior. Okay. All right, the environment, affective tone is inconsistent, unpredictable, parent behavior management issues, possible parental psychopathology, dangerous and limited recreational um, resources, and he had that precipitating event of the friend leaving. Um, so we would, um, you know, we, we affective tone of the house, we've talked about that. Um, probably, well, we're going to talk about the treatment plan in a minute. So remember our um, model is the stress diathesis model. So we've got the st those stressors, possible diatheses that we've talked about. And um, here's how you kind of would plug it in, in each of the areas. Okay, so you take the um, behaviors and um, the problems and then plug them into each of the different areas and you'd have the cognition that supports them. All right, so when you think about um, CBT, which of these kind of circles would you have thought was um, kind of defining CBT are most relevant to it. Right. So that's what usually happens is people think, oh, CBT is all about cognition and that's it. You just change their thinking and they get all better. Well, that's not really true. Remember, it's cognitive behavior therapy. And so you're concerned about the cognition, the behavior, the emotions, the biological basis, because CBT is a, um, in evidence based approach to treatment. And so we know that there are biological bases to um, kids' disorders. And we know from our behavioral background that learning history and primary environments are really critical. Okay? So when you're conceptualizing the case, you're taking all of these things into consideration. So um, you would then go from your problem list to your treatment strategies. Mom's substance abuse. Well, you're going to refer mom for treatment for her substance abuse, and if she doesn't go, you're going to um, uh, kind of count on the leverage from Child Protective Services to get her to stop abusing. Inconsistent behavior management. We're going to teach mom some positive behavior management strategies and conflict resolution skills. Chaos and neglect. Again, we're going to go with the positive behavior management. We're going to create some routine and schedule and try to build in some positive time. Parental modeling of poor coping and problem solving. We're going to teach mom both of those things and how to do them. Lack of recreational activities. We're going to actually schedule them for the family. Inconsistent expression of affection, or do some communication training and teach them how to do it. And lack of healthy social relationships, we're going to try to work at getting them more socially and recreationally active. Um, you got the cognitive issues, I'm unlovable. Well, we're going to teach mom the positive behavior management. Um, conflict resolution, and we're going to do a lot of cognitive restructuring with Mike. I'm helpless, same kind of things. World's unpredictable, um, same kind of interventions, same with the future is unpredictable. People use others. 
a lot of education and social skills training there, as well as the cognitive restructuring. It's horrible, unbearable to feel bad. You got co coping skills training. Getting high fixes everything. I'm going to want to restructure that. People aren't there. The parent training and cognitive restructuring. There aren't consequences for my behavior. The positive behavior management again. Um, some school consultation so that he actually is getting consequences. He's pretty slick at avoiding them. Um, emotions are bad. I'm going to want him to experience emotions and know how to manage them. And don't get close, they leave. I'm going to do some social skills training and cognitive restructuring. Uh, lack of recreational skills, I'm going to teach him. Um, recreational skills, do them with him, schedule them. Same with getting him behaviorally activated. Inappropriate behavior, we're going to have consequences, the chaos. We're going to do a lot of psychoed and getting him to self monitor his chaos. Poor sleep hygiene, we're going to teach him sleep hygiene. And we're going to get some consequences at home so that he actually um, goes to bed on time. The dysphoria and irritability, we're going to do um, coping skills, training, activity scheduling, looking at the positive and a lot of restructuring. Chaos, we're going to change the home through the positive behavior management routines. Um, we're going to give him some affective ed and coping so he learns about variety of emotions and then not be afraid of them. And I'm going to teach him that there's a link between how he feels, thinks, and behaves. Um, you can see this intervention goes on and on, doesn't it? <laughs> But that's just the nature of the kids that have multiple disorders. And um, it's the kind of conceptualizing that's important to do so that you have a plan that takes you through a complicated intervention. What about the treatment components in the intervention and how do they match up to Mike? All right, so we're going to do some. Um, Affective education. So we're going to be teaching Mike about depression. And with Mike, we're going to talk about um, substance abuse, too, and the impact of substance abuse and the impact of living with parents who are substance abusers. And um, real quickly, we're going to introduce coping. As remember, he's a kid who doesn't believe that he can manage mood and that emotions are all bad. Um, Third meeting, we're going to keep the affective ed, the psycho ed going. We're going to do some um, coping skills training again, and we're going to actually start to um, schedule pleasant activities into his life, and that's the catch the positive diary. Individual meeting where we're going to set goals. Actually, going to try to get Mike to set some goals for himself, which wasn't um, real easy. It took him a while to kind of get it. I did more setting goals than he did. Um, in the group sitting situation, um, we're going to start to, we'd actually be building more group cohesion because we're about to get into um, kind of deeper stuff. And so that idea of having a real trusting environment where you don't have to worry about confidentiality being broken, we had to bring that, we brought that in systematically a number of times to try to, um, each time we went into something that was kind of more cognitive, more intimate, we brought the idea of group cohesion and uh, confidentiality back into the group. You can see we're going to continue to build coping skills. And there's a little introduction to problem solving, an introduction to cognitive restructuring, and then we're moving into problem solving. So the first half of treatment is really designed to help the kids learn how to manage unpleasant emotions, bring their mood up, reduce stress, um, change undesirable situations, change their primary environment, increase in engagement in pleasant activities. So really what we're trying to do is activate the kids, trying to get them um, kind of re-engaged in life, really active so their mood's up. So our, our primary goal for the first nine sessions is going to be getting their mood up through 
coping skills training, and problem solving. And then the latter half is, um, emphasizes cognitive restructuring. So really within the treatment um, manual, all the ingredients necessary for Mike are there. And um, so we're going to go into the affective ad and coping skills. When we're doing the group intervention, we want to build group, group cohesion, we want to build a safe environment, and um, we want to get them to recognize the cues that they're experiencing different emotions. So if you think of a depressed kid and you ask that child um, how they're feeling, what do they say? I feel bad. That's about it. All right? So initially, it's all bad. And they don't really recognize gradations in how um, bad they're feeling. You know? And they don't notice when they're feeling good because they have selective recall. And the selective recall is it was all bad. Right? So what I want to do is I want to help them to see that they experience a range of emotions and that um, over the course of the day, there are times when they feel good. So it's really rare to have a depressed um, child and even a depressed adolescent who truly feels horrible the entire day. There's usually, especially for the kids, um, times in the day when they feel better and um, I want them to recognize those times. So if you have a depressed adult, um, what does that depressed adult do um, in terms of their social life, in terms of recreational life, in terms of getting out? They withdraw. They withdraw. Okay? And they can do that because um, they have more control over their everyday environment. Um, what about kids? What's different? Irritability. Okay, so there's irritability, but um, they have to go to school. They can't withdraw as much as an adult can. They go to school and they have, if it's an elementary age kid, they have recess. They have lunch with other kids. They have PE class. They have a teacher that um, actually you know, spends time with them and can be very um, nurturing to them. So kids aren't able to withdraw and get stuck in the depression like adults can. So there are more times, more opportunities for their mood to lift naturally. Okay, so if... Um, I want to capitalize on that. What am I going to want a depressed kid to pay attention to? Times when they feel good. And then, if I've got them paying attention to times when they feel good, I'm going to ask them what was going on at that time. All right? So, if I can identify things that make that child feel better, what am I going to do as a therapist? I'm going to prescribe that. So one of the cool things about working with kids that are depressed is you get to prescribe having fun. That's not a bad thing. The kids actually like to then come to therapy because you do fun things in your sessions and you're telling, asking their parents to do more fun things with the kids and you're actually building into the kids' everyday schedule fun activities. So um, I want them to self-monitor when they feel good because that um, helps me to identify things I'm going to use for coping. And if they notice that they're having fun, what does that do? It restructures the belief I never have any, I never have fun. I'm helpless. There's nothing I can do 
to make myself feel better. If I've gotten them to recognize their mood goes up and down, and there are things that bring their mood up, they're no longer helpless. And they no longer believe there's nothing that makes me feel good. I feel bad all the time. So again, keep in mind that idea that kids actively seek um, an understanding of what's going on around them. And if I can help them to see that they, uh, their mood goes up, they're going to try to make meaning of that. And the meaning is, oh, my mood actually is variable. There are times when I feel good. It's not so hopeless. Maybe I can get better. All right? Okay, so we are talking about um, educating the kids about their emotions and why that's important. And um, about creating a safe environment, we've talked pretty much about that. Um, and we'll talk about the web activity a little bit later for the sake of time. Um, we'll set goals with the kids. And um, okay, so the therapeutic alliance, what are the two primary components of the Therapeutic Alliance. We know that the Therapeutic Alliance contributes to the overall effectiveness of therapy. So what are the two goals? I mean the two components? Okay, kind of. So there's building, there's building the therapeutic relationship and there is having common goals that you're working toward. So in order to have the therapeutic, the therapeutic alliance, you have to have the relationship plus goals. So we set goals with the kids, and then um, we also build the therapeutic relationship, and we work towards those goals. So if you have a depressed kid and they're feeling helpless, how many goals do you want them to set? Two. Yeah, right. Just a couple, because if you... If we laid out for Mike all the problems that he had and all the goals I had for him, he'd be overwhelmed. But if I start with, okay, we want to work on helping you to um, feel better, feel happy more of the time, you know, that's one simple one that we can work on. Okay? And having goals gives you a direction to the treatment. Um, we do the goal setting collaboratively, and as they obtain the goals, it leads to that sense of self-efficacy. All right, so this was one of the kids in the group's um, goals, and um, so we would set it up as the goal, and then how you're going to get that through coping, problem solving, and changing thinking. So we always structured their goals that way so they could see there is a link between their goals and the treatment. Okay, so how, um, in the affective ed part, um, we had this concept of the emotion detective. And so we wanted the girls to, um, in the study, to learn how to recognize how they're feeling. So how do you figure out um, what emotion you're experiencing? What are the clues that you use? Okay, it's the three B's. What's happening in your body, your behavior, and your brain. That's how we figure out what we're feeling. We feel it in our bodies, we see it in our actions, and um, we know it based on what we're thinking. So um, for the depressed kids, remember, they think it's all bad, so we've got to get them to recognize other emotions and to recognize that um, there are gradations to bad, from really bad to uh, not so bad. Okay? It's if I've got a depressed kid I'm working with, um, moving from really bad to, eh, not so bad, is an improvement. And I'm willing to get that kind of improvement because I know that that could precede, I feel okay. 
all right? So um, I'm going to work with the kids on recognizing what's happening in their brain, their body, and their behavior to um, help them to understand their emotions. So we had these um, simple cutouts um, that we used in the groups. And um, so let's say that um, one of the kids came in and she said, um, when you asked how, how are you feeling or she was talking about her week or something that happened and she said, I was feeling really sad. Okay? So the therapist then would say to her, okay, so what was happening um, in your body? And the kids would often say, um, I was heartbroken. So with the colored marker, the therapist might draw a broken heart. Okay? I was feeling really um, weighted down. So the therapist might draw weights on the arms or like strings that are kind of pulling the um, child's arms down. Okay, so um, anything else happening in your body? Oh, um, I was feeling kind of weak. And so they might draw squiggly lines on the legs or something like they're rubbery or weak. And um, what about what was happening with your behavior? And um, the child would say, I was crying. So they draw tears. That there's a link between what you think, what you feel, and how you act. So in a real simple way, I'm starting to help the child to come up with their own cognitive behavioral conceptualization of their problems. So um, in the group, what we would do is um, every time the kids would mention an emotion, therapists would whip out the um, cutout and um, would draw it in along with the kids. As therapy went along, switched from the therapist doing it to the kids doing it themselves. And um, I went through a bunch um, before coming here and I thought, oh wow, these are great, I should really bring them. I thought, no, confidentiality, I really can't do that. So it was really unfortunate because the kids did some incredible um, drawings that really pointed out the that they were experiencing and the thoughts that they had that underlied that um, pain. It was really impressive. So um, it's, it's real simple, works really well, really quickly, and um, the kids have fun doing it, and they get it. Oh, yeah, you do have to watch for um, confusion about thoughts and emotions. So, like, um, I was feeling really smart, or I felt really stupid. Well, you don't feel stupid. You might feel embarrassed, but you're thinking to yourself you're stupid, or you're thinking to yourself you're smart. So, um, why would that be important? Why is that language important in CBT? Yeah, right, because we're going to be changing thoughts to change emotions. So um, it's, it's important to kind of socialize the kids to thinking that way. Likewise, it's important to socialize the therapists to doing that. So when I would be doing supervision, they would slip and um, mix up the two. So um, we had like um, posters and handouts for the kids. And this is one of the handouts that pointed out um, how you tell what you're feeling based on your body, behavior, and brain. And there's the emotion detective. And the cutouts. Talked about how to use the cutouts. Oh, another simple activity, um, maybe I'll give it to you as a homework assignment over lunchtime. Um, was um, we had these lunch bags. And lunch bags came in really helpful um, for activities that the kids would do. So what we would do is we'd have inside the bag um, hearts 
with the names of emotions on them, and thought bubbles that had a thought in them. Okay? And then the kids in a group would take turns pulling a thought bubble or a heart out of the bag. Okay. So if I draw, if I pull a um, emotion out of the bag, I'm going to describe what that emotion is, the three Bs that told me about it, and I have to say what I was thinking that led to that emotion. Okay? If I draw a thought bubble out, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to tell what the emotion is that goes with that thought. So now, and it's really easy to do. The kids get it because they link up very nicely. So as a result of that activity, what have we just explained to the kids? What have they learned? Right, the connection between thinking and feeling. And so we would do that a couple times. You just do it for a few minutes. And it very concretely creates that link. And it makes sense. And it's credible. So again, we're building the rationale for the um, treatment and um, through activities. And we're teaching them the therapeutic concepts through activities. Okay? So um, we're at 1224. So we have six minutes before we break. So um, we've done our kind of skills for the morning. So now we would review. Okay? So what are the main um, things that you think we talked about since break? Conceptualization. All right, conceptualization. And when you're conceptualizing the case, the first step is to create the problem list. And then the next step is to think about what are the um, thoughts, the beliefs that underlie each of those problems. Okay? So if as grad students you're looking for what's the you know, evidence base for that, you look at persons is the name. Um, persons did research on um, case conceptualization. There's very little research on case conceptualization and its impact on um, therapeutic outcome. And um, so persons found that there is a um, relationship between case conceptualization and treatment outcome, and there's better outcome when you conceptualize the case. And she said that there were two parts to case conceptualization, the problem list and then thinking about what are the thoughts that underlie each of the problem. So we're using her model for case conceptualization. Okay? So um, what are the, um, so that talked about the problems and the thoughts that went along with those problems. What are the other pieces of the conceptualization that are important to us from a CBT perspective? Behaviors. behaviors. Okay, so behaviors, thoughts, what else? The environment, the learning history, emotions, and the biology. Okay? So I'm gonna, I want to know what's going on in each of those areas and how it all fits together when I'm conceptualizing the case. Okay, and then treatment planning. What did we do on the board for Mike or up on the... Um, Overhead, we listed the problems and then treatment for each of those problems. Okay? And then remember, the interventions were cognitive interventions, behavioral interventions, um, environmental interventions, um, interventions designed to impact them affectively. All right? So um, we brought in a lot of different strategies. And the first half of the intervention is designed to do what? Behavioral activation. Behavioral activation. Teaching and through teaching them coping skills and problem solving. Okay, so that's the big part of the um, initial part of the intervention. And then um, 
why do we teach um, the kids about emotion and how do we do it? The three Bs. The three Bs. Yep, the body. Yeah, that's it. So we get them to use the three Bs and that teaches them the link between thinking, feeling, and behavior. And that gives them the cognitive behavioral conceptualization. Okay, so um, we reviewed and then um, we would do our kind of um, check-in. How are we doing so far? We doing okay? All right. And um, then homework between now and um, when we come back from lunch. Um, okay, I got it. Um, you're going to self-monitor when you feel good and um, what you were thinking and um, what was happening. All right? Okay.